everyone uh, to this uh, panel discussion. I'm Lorenzo Angelini. I work for EPLO, the European Peace Building Liaison Office. Um, EPLO is a network of civil society organizations uh, based in Europe, um, active uh, in the field of pre conflict prevention and peace building. And we're very happy to be organizing this panel discussion today, which is entitled uh, Building Peace and Protecting the Environment, Supporting the Roles of Civil Society Actors in the Middle East. Uh, as you just saw, the session takes pla place as part of this year's edition of the Berlin Climate and Security Conference, which is organized by Delphi and the German Federal Foreign Office. Uh, so we will start uh, with uh, interventions by our two speakers before opening the floor to the audience uh, for an interactive discussion. Uh, so feel free to ask questions, to share comments and experiences, uh, and to engage with our speakers. Uh, I will note that the session is being recorded. It will be published on the YouTube channels of EPLO and Adelphi in the coming days. Uh, before I introduce our two speakers, I wanted to note that unfortunately Mariko Peters from the European External Action Service had to cancel her participation as speaker today. Uh, she will not be able to join the session due to personal uh, reasons. Uh, so our two speakers, uh, which we uh, very much welcome, are Haider al Ibrahimi, uh, who is uh, working as director of the Peace Paradigms uh, organization. Um, and we also have Abdelrahman Sultan, uh, who is working as Deputy Director for EcoPeace Middle East. Uh, many thanks again uh, to Abdelrahman uh, for agreeing to participate instead of uh, your director, Yana Abu Taleb, as she was not available for, for the meeting. Uh, so I want to acknowledge that this means uh, we will have only uh, men on the panel today, uh, for which I would like to, to apologize sincerely. Uh, so we will now start with the uh, presentations from our two speakers, uh, and after they are done, I will open the floor for questions, comments, uh, and an interactive uh, discussion. So, Haider, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, uh, good morning, uh, everyone, and um, I'm very happy to be here with you, uh, to share with you uh, our experiences um, on the Iraqi context share with you um, some of the ma major challenges uh, that peace building actors, whether national or internationals, are uh, dealing with. Then we'll uh, try to highlight uh, what are the implications of climate change and environmental degradation on exacerbating the drivers of uh, tension and conflict. And we'll wrap it up quickly with some recommendations that will enable, uh, hopefully, the peace building actors uh, to provide better and more uh, effective response to these issues. Um, if we move to the next slide, uh, please. Um, speaking of the Iraqi context, uh, we are talking about more than 20 years uh, since 2003. Uh, the U.S. invasion and the change, uh, the Ba'athist regime. Uh, at the time, Iraq continues to facing several challenges to peace and, and stability uh, for many reasons, uh, uh, of course, but at the top of the list is uh, the lack of uh, capacity of state institutions to provide the basic public services uh, to the citizens uh, issues around the neutrality and efficiency of the judiciary uh, system, the security provisioning, uh, et cetera, which uh, led to uh, a lot of frustrations at the community level, uh, wide uh, perception of uh, uh, marginalization and exclusion feeling uh, uh, of the incapacity of the local or federal authorities to be able to live up to the expectations and requirements of the citizens. Of course, uh, these are uh, critical trends which open the door for extremist uh, groups uh, uh, to kick in in the, uh, in the country because obviously the drivers of tensions and grievances have not been addressed uh, efficiently by, by the government. Noting here that uh, there was a massive support from the international community on different uh, sectors. However, the political uh, division, and as I said earlier, the lack of efficiency of state institutions uh, stood as a barrier to uh, address 
uh, these issues. Almost five years after uh, the Iraqi government declared the militarized uh, victory over uh, ISIS, but still there are wide areas uh, still destroyed or only partially <clears throat> uh, reconstructed. Uh, the security provisions stay uh, fragmented and often detached from the interest of local communities. Um, in the eyes of the citizens, uh, the state institutions are <clears throat> sorry, becoming symbolic because the key resources and key capacities are, are lacking. Uh, inability to address uh, critical issues resulted from uh, the large waves of displacement as a result of the violent conflict in Iraq and post-return to address issues around reintegration, rebuilding, uh, trust relationships between and among the communities and between communities and uh, authorities, handling uh, the, the issues around community acceptance to the return of families with perceived affiliation uh, to ISIS, which comes with a very, very wide uh, scale of um, unaddressed problems. Of course, these issues will create uh, social uh, friction, uh, decreased trust between among the communities, uh, decreased trust in the uh, main institutions such as the security and judiciary system, and promoted for the emergence of parallel systems such as a parallel system to the uh, security institutions represented by the presence of the armed groups. The tribal mechanisms that are becoming competing with the judiciary system um, uh, in Iraq, uh, critical <clears throat> and, and key segments in the community, such as underrepresented groups, such as minorities, persons with disabilities, women and youth, uh, left abandoned, uh, feeling uh, completely isolated from decision making, policy making, contribution uh, at any any level, um, massive scale of uh, of need, uh, complexity, high complexity of uh, of issues that peace building actors, among others, uh, of course, have been dealing with over uh, the past years. If we move to the next uh, slide, uh, so that we can briefly um, highlight what we as one of the local peace building actors do in order to contribute to respond to uh, these issues. Basically, we invest a lot of time and resources to highlight the drivers of tension and conflict, observing context, uh, context development, <clears throat> sharing these uh, analysis with uh, the larger community of practice so that uh, they can design and implement the proper response uh, to the issues, especially building off the knowledge uh, that we have the social makeup, political structures, uh, economic, etc., which also serves as an entry point for uh, designing uh, local peace processes, which we uh, apply across uh, the country, bridging the divides between communities, in, in, in different areas, helping them to take the lead in uh, providing alternatives and localized solutions to their issues, linking them uh, with different uh, local authority institutions as well as them and uh, donor international community so that we can create this direct linkage and direct uh, relationship so that they can inform uh, their policymaking, decision-making, and programming as well. And given the high trend uh, in Iraq, we are talking about over 5 million IDPs uh, as a result of the violent conflict. It's a very big uh, issue dealing with this caseload during displacement and post uh, displacement, uh, displacement PPO is one of the local organizations that have been heavily engaged on this uh, profile, trying to address critical issues such as stigmatization, stereotyping, radicalization, uh, uh, building relationships, healing relationships between communities so that they can 
coexist positively, uh, recreate social bonds and become more collaborative and um, uh, cohesive. Uh, also, one of the key priority areas we are working uh, in over the past two or three years is that we are helping the institutionalization and capacity building of local peace structures, uh, such as local peace committees, youth, voluntary groups, women, uh, councils, etc., because they are local resources. They have a very deep understanding of the local context issues. Uh, they can find ways to address their issues and build the bridges between communities and between them, local authorities, uh, etc. At the same time, uh, throughout all the peace processes that we are implementing, uh, very uh, high level of engagement on advocacy uh, level to make sure that uh, peace building processes are actually uh, inclusive, participatory, uh, context-informed, and um, uh, that's basically important in Iraq because we are dealing with a lot of uh, minorities feeling discriminated and isolated from uh, the broader system. And also talking about women and, and youth lacking the voice, uh, freedom of expression and contribution uh, as well, given the complexities of the issues and the social makeup, the dominant uh, tribalism uh, across uh, the country. That's in a nutshell uh, what uh, we do uh, as local peace building actor among, uh, among others. If we move to the next slide, please, we can briefly also talk about the implications of a climate change on the existing drivers of tension and conflict at a uh, uh, at different levels. And worth mentioning here that currently we are implementing a pilot uh, a project with Adelphi and Berghoff Foundation, thanks uh, to the support of the German Foreign Federal Office. We are implementing it in nine districts across five governorates to basically try to understand what are these implications exactly? How do they affect uh, local uh, communities and how do they contribute to uh, multiply the effect of the current drivers of tension and, and conflict? Diversity of the locations we are operating in uh, from the south, center, eastern Iraq and northern Iraq. So these are different realities, different examples uh, that we can uh, look into. It was clearly obvious that environmental uh, degradation, desertification, uh, the increase of desert storms, uh, temperatures, etc., have contributed to uh, push entire communities to leave their areas, head towards uh, urban cities, and here where they start to create even more frustration on the community level because they see them competing over public services, uh, local economic opportunities, uh, etc. It created also a lot of tribal disputes and tribal conflicts over water shares, uh, land uh, disputes, and there were actually examples of uh, violent conflicts between and, and among tribes, which also contributed to increase the frustration of the community that local authorities are still incapable of addressing these issues and needs, which is, uh, of course, very, very critical uh, at this moment in, in, uh, in Iraq. Uh, in addition to health uh, issues, extreme health issues, uh, economic issues. Uh, they are uh, different from one area to, to, to another, but broadly uh, speaking, it has been uh, evidently identified that these uh, environmental factors have contributed to um, exacerbate drivers of tension and conflict, increase division between communities, increase isolation between communities, especially when we talk about 
the liberated areas where we are still dealing with reintegration issues between host communities and returnees. If we are talking about returnees from uh, families with perceived affiliation to ISIS, this has become one of the big issues because when they return to their areas of origin and they lack the water resources and the proper conditions for them to re-practice their farming uh, business, uh, for example, when they cannot do that and they are still pushed back from the host communities, not given uh, their chance uh, to restart again post-return, this, of course, made the task uh, for peace building actors and for the mediation work becomes even more, uh, more challenging. One other area is that we are exploring as well is the extent to which we can address some of these existing tensions via uh, local dialogue mechanisms and uh, examine how we can scale it up and replicate it in different contexts across different areas in Iraq. Um, at the same time, creating the proper linkages with local authorities so that they can see uh, practical examples of such issues are actually resolvable uh, via, uh, via uh, systemic uh, approaches. Finally, we will try to uh, uh, establish a platform that brings together high officials at the government level with donor international uh, organizations so that they can establish the conversation around strategic solutions to climate change implications on peace and, and security in the country, which involves different aspects. This will go uh, beyond the local context because there are grievances that that water shortage in Iraq, for example, is resulting from uh, diplomatic issues with neighboring uh, countries. So a conversation at this level uh, should uh, address this type of, uh, of, uh, of issues that is uh, cross borders, uh, let's say. Uh, even when uh, we uh, deal with existing conflicts and uh, across uh, the past years. And when we observe local organizations, civil society actors, international actors, dealing with these issues without the label of, uh, these are applications of uh, climate change. They've been always addressed as uh, a status quo, let's say. Uh, now it has become more trendy. We are seeing a number of international organizations are paying some uh, efforts to assess, understand these implications, explore solutions uh, or alternatives, trying to create a conversation with authorities so that they can maximize the workforce to address this, which is to us peace building actors in, in the country is excellent news. Now we feel that this is going to have proper dedication, uh, proper interest of donor communities and, and, and government to actually take uh, further steps uh, to addressing these, these issues. Uh, to sum it up with uh, some recommendations, uh, if we move to the next slide, uh, please. We would briefly uh, share these recommendations that we need to learn from the past experiences and address the issues of coordination and, and, and exchange. Uh, because we have seen it before, there are just so many uh, actors are working to address uh, issues. We always face the problem of the lack of coordination and exchange. We don't necessarily know what, for example, UNDP is doing around this topic or IOM is doing around this topic. Uh, which creates uh, overlap and repetition and will add to the frustration of the communities at the end. It will also be confusing for authorities if they have uh, different conversations with different actors around the same topic and they see them lacking the alignment or uh, synergy does not exist. 
These are examples that we've been facing in Iraq when issues around uh, preventing violent extremism or uh, transitional justice uh, issues, uh, for example, we see different organizations uh, providing different uh, programs, not saying that they are bad uh, programming, or, or, but the lack of coordination creates a lot of problems. That said, now that in Iraq, uh, the attention to addressing climate uh, uh, implications on peace and security in the country, uh, we believe that will be uh, great if coordination platforms are established so that the alignment is created at an early uh, stage and programming is properly directed so that it serves uh, different purposes without application, without unnecessary overlapping and waste of uh, resources or creation, uh, creating confusion uh, at the community and authorities level. Uh, second thing we would be recommending is to try to adapt holistic uh, approaches to the extent possible. These responses, different programming to be governed by a broader uh, strategy. Uh, we don't see it helpful or, or useful if a variety of organizations are tasked with different uh, pieces uh, of the process and they do not synergize uh, at the end. Uh, we have seen it also uh, before, we will lose time, we will lose efforts, and then the goals are uh, poorly achieved five, 10 years uh, from now. The more the response is holistic, uh, the more is, uh, it is governed by a, a reference. That could be a joint strategy between Iraqi government and uh, specific, I don't know, donors or uh, international uh, organizations, or by providing enough technical capacity for the Iraqi government to come up with strategic priorities, strategic directions to address these issues so that they become the guiding framework for local actors uh, to work with and organize their responses um, accordingly. The other thing is, uh, to invest in building the capacity of civil society uh, actors so that their response becomes more effective uh, and, and, and more uh, relevant uh, to the need. Uh, of course, uh, localized uh, solutions uh, are, are key uh, to, to this process. People know what alternatives uh, should work, but they don't know how to uh, to apply them. And it has been tested uh, over the past years that when we listen to local voices and we consult with them to generate alternatives, they often work because they feel ownership uh, and they feel more engaged. Uh, it's always the general perception at the community level that a programming in, in Iraq is derived by external practices that does not necessarily fit in with the Iraqi uh, context, uh, not necessarily tailored to the uh, local realities. So the more the process is informed by uh, local actors, the more it fits with local realities, requirements, uh, restrictions, conditions, etc. the more it will become uh, feasible and and um, and, and measurable uh, as well. Uh, lastly, uh, uh, we would recommend that uh, international organizations, especially the specialized ones, to try to introduce uh, to Iraq some of the modern technologies that could help addressing environmental issues. We provide the permaculture. Um, uh, example because we have seen it working effectively in some countries in the Arab region and given the similarity in the um, uh, I don't know, the climate uh, conditions we believe it uh, it should work it will be an effective uh, solution for local communities to find alternatives that they can uh, cope with during this climate crisis in, in Iraq. 
I'll stop here. Uh, I'll be happy, of course, to answer any questions, provide more uh, more details. We are talking about the Iraq context. Uh, there is just a lot of uh, issues and realities to be shared, but this is what time can can allow. And again, we'll be happy to answer any questions later on. Back to you, Lawrence. Thanks a lot, Haider. Thanks a lot for the very insightful uh, presentation. We'll open the floor for questions and comments after uh, the second presentation. So I'll now give the floor to Abdelrahman uh, Sultan. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Lorenzo, uh, for the invite. Uh, uh, my name is Abdelrahman Sultan. I'm the Regional uh, Program Director at EcoPC Middle East and the Deputy Director of the Jordanian Office. And um, I would like to share my screen. Second. Yes. Uh, I would like to speak about uh, building peace and protecting the environment in the Middle East. And in this case, we have a special uh, context because we have uh, three countries, uh, Jordan, Palestine, and Israel. And uh, when we speak about Jordan, Palestine, and Israel, we speak about long-term conflict between the three countries and three people uh, that is uh, beyond 70 years. And it has also not only a political conflict at the moment, but also some kind of cultural conflict and religious conflict that extends beyond the 70 years. So uh, working in the Middle East, trying to uh, create a good environment for building trust between the people and building trust to save the environment for all is quite challenging. Uh, at all levels, and it needs lots of uh, patience and uh, to be equipped with the right tools to do so. Uh, why water is important in the Middle East? Uh, the Middle East, as you know, it's, it's quite small area on, on a global scale, as you can see from the map, uh, but we're very much uh, affected by the climate change that is becoming more and more evident in the last uh, few years. Uh, today it's October, uh, almost 18, and we did not have any drop of rain this year uh, in Jordan. So it's it's very, very dry. People are not very optimistic about the upcoming winter. Um, we expected that climate change will increase the temperature uh, by 1.5 degree uh, centigrade. But in the Middle East, we already have that. And we expect uh, actually that we will have two more degrees in addition to uh, the general increase of uh, climate change. Therefore, the, the implication on our region is quite high. Uh, in our region, uh, we have Jordan, where it's the second poorest water country on the globe. Uh, we have also uh, occupation of parts of the Palestinian uh, territories where people are deprived from uh, water access, still depend on gallons and etc. And we have a major uh, water uh, issue. So uh, we have also population growth that is exceeding uh, all expectations. Uh, in the last years, we had also in Jordan, we had uh, 1.8 million uh, refugees from Syria uh, following the Iraqi conflict uh, that we also had around 800,000 people from Iraq. And we have uh, many more from uh, Lebanon and Palestine and many other countries. So the population growth in our region is growing uh, really rapidly, and it creates a nuisance in terms of uh, water uh, supply. Uh, this is something that uh, our water managers cannot uh, resolve at the moment. Uh, the other problem that we have in our region, which is uh, how small we are, how fragmented we are, and how energy costs are uh, increasing all the day, uh, all days, and reflected on general cost of life. So it's becoming more and more expensive uh, to afford to live in such region with limited resources that uh, we have. Therefore, we what what we see at the moment, without cooperation, what we see is a lose lose situation where we expect that situation uh, on a social level and environmental level continue to worsen uh, in the coming few years. Therefore, it is uh, very important, actually, it's vital for our survival 
to have what we call cooperation for surviving in this region. And the, the most pressing uh, element is water. And water is very much connected to energy and food supply and other uh, sorts of uh, issues. I would like to speak a little bit about our region and uh, mention how difficult also to work here we have, as I mentioned before, we have the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And uh, yes, we tried in 1994 to uh, solve part of it through the Oslo uh, Agreement, but the Oslo Agreement did not resolve uh, much uh, of what we wanted to uh, resolve. Uh, therefore, we had so many files, so many issues still uh, waiting to be resolved for the, what we call the final stages. Uh, we at EcoPeace Middle East, we don't believe that water should wait for the final stages to be resolved. Therefore, we, had, we wanted to make sure that water is addressed at the moment at many levels to make sure that the uh, Palestinians, uh, Jordanian, Lebanese, Israelis uh, have their equal share amount of water from different resources to make sure that we have the minimum uh, of the WHO uh, per day per capita of water uh, supplied for uh, domestic use, but also for other services such as agriculture and development. So this is something that needs to, uh, to, to continue to happen. Uh, it's not easy during the continuous fast changing regimes in our region, and we have seen that how the Israeli election affected uh, cooperation uh, positively and negatively in the last uh, few years. The competition over water resources, as I mentioned, is something that is uh, common um, upstream versus downstream, and that has led to a complete deterioration of major important rivers, such as the Jordan River, which is a holy river for most, for more than half humanity uh, on the globe. Uh, we know that uh, Jordan River and Yarmouk Rivers are a trickle at the moment. And uh, the, um, the only amount of water that is flowing in the Jordan River is, uh, how you call it, uh, bad water in terms of agriculture uh, runoff and polluted water, etc., and very saline water. Uh, so it's it's very sad to see a major uh, source of life has deteriorated that quickly in less than uh, 50 to 70 years uh, of our uh, recent uh, history. The 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 last uh, uh, pandemic that happened, uh, Corona, that we all suffered from. But here, the Jordanian government uh, in Jordan uh, decided that agriculture should be the priority, and uh, they allowed more water. Uh, to be uh, delivered to the farmers. And because of that, uh, they thought the government that this will solve uh, food supply to the local communities. As a result, two years after, we have seen that most of our dams are get, uh, getting empty and dry. The groundwater is deteriorating very rapidly at the moment. And sign of unsustainability becomes very, very obvious uh, at the moment, and we have doubts if we can continue in the same uh, pattern at the moment, or something major should happen in order to reverse the the problem. So, this how strategic uh, that decision was at that time, and what are the consequences that we are suffering from at the moment? This is something that needs to be addressed at the highest level of decision making uh, in uh, in Jordan and also uh, in the region and globally. The, I, I mentioned before the Arab Spring uh, had uh, severe consequences on our region. 1.8 uh, million uh, Syrian refugees came to Jordan. 1.8 million, 1 .8 million uh, Syrian refugees need water. They need sanitation services. And at the moment, if I may say that the international aid that came to Jordan to help those refugees uh, to be able to past that time or to survive, we are augmenting the problem and we might see that in the near future that Syrian refugees in Jordan, if they did not go back to Syria and the, uh, as a result, the groundwater aquifer and the surface water aquifers uh, are not replenished, then we might see another uh, uh, bad uh, situation where we have social unrest in Jordan and we might see that Jordanian themselves will need to uh, leave the country because of shortage of water and the uh, situation will become very bad. 
looking into the future, what could be the solution? Ecopeace proposed what we call the Green Blue Deal. And this is something that is looking at the region at large, trying to solve and create what we call win-win situation. The first chapter of the Green Blue Deal speaks about water energy nexus, where we believe that Jordan has the advantage, vast desert with uh, beautiful sunshine that can be uh, habitat for uh, renewable energy production, PV production, and also wind production in Jordan. While on Mediterranean coast, we know that Israel is leading in desalination technology. So if the two sides cooperate uh, on this uh, matter, then we will provide renewable energy that is very much needed for uh, water uh, production uh, and desalination. And this is something that ECOPIS is looking at, trying to say uh, then uh, regional cooperation might be possible in order to save uh, this region in terms of water and energy together. Uh, efforts to rehabilitate the Jordan River, it's something that needs to continue. Jordan River, as I mentioned, is in poor condition. But today, the governments of Jordan, Israel, and Palestine understand the severity of the issue. We still have impediments that uh, push uh, to, that will help us to move forward in terms of creating what we call a trust fund between the three countries in order to provide the needed financial resources to advance uh, projects and solution um, at the basin level, not only at the country level, because the uh, the problem is not only a national, it's a regional problem. Therefore, uh, regional cooperation is also very much needed. And uh, ECOPIS is calling for a committee that works on the River uh, Jordan Basin that looks at all pollution sources, trying to reduce them, and how can we improve the biodiversity, how can we improve the water distribution, and use the river as conduit of fresh water rather than a canal of bad uh, saline uh, sewage water. Uh, the third component of the Green Blue Deal speaks about the Palestinian-Israeli water agreement. And as I mentioned, uh, we needed to make sure that the water does not stay until the very final stage uh, of agreement or solution. We need to make sure that Palestinian and Israelis see the need to resolve the current problems. At the moment, the current problems can be categorized in two main categories. One, one is uh, sorry for that. One is looking at how can we increase the water supply to the Palestinian, and the second, how can we reduce pollution to all parties? So this is where we create a win-win situation for both the Palestinian and the Israelis at the moment. It's not an easy task. It needs lots of uh, scientific research, modeling, and we're using top researchers uh, on, uh, on a global uh, level working with the uh, Swedish International, Stockholm International Institute, Environmental Institute and other uh, important institutes uh, in the region to resolve this uh, matter. And everything here, again, it needs awareness. And awareness needs a top-down awareness that is reflected on the decision makers uh, to uh, change policies, but also on the bottom up to increase uh, uh, the buy-in from the local society being gender, balanced uh, youth or uh, different stakeholders at the community level. As I mentioned before, here we have the top-down initiatives and here we would like to have a regional cooperation between uh, the countries. The uh, signing of the letter of intent last uh, year uh, between Jordan and Israel and the United Arab Emirates helped uh, to lay a foundation for potential cooperation in the future where we uh, exchange water and energy between the three countries, uh, between the three countries, uh, Jordan, Palestine, and Israel, to make sure that we uh, ex expand the pie of uh, available renewable water and energy. And uh, also working on the multiple uh, complex uh, uh, files that we have in our region, which is the uh, Jordan River and sustainability of the mountain aquifer between the Palestinians and Israelis. We produced a master plan. The master plan looks at the holistic approach. Of how can we resolve the Jordan River? Uh, it includes uh, seven thematic uh, areas. And in each area, we have a number of uh, priority projects that needs to happen on ecological rehabilitation, on pollution control, 
and sustainable agriculture, sustainable water management and river rehabilitation, urban infrastructure development, tourism, and uh, creating a governing body to make sure that we are looking at the development of the Jordan Valley in a, a comprehensive manner and to make sure that we leave no sector behind. And we have seen that uh, unilateral decisions uh, or sudden decision will have negative uh, environmental consequences and also social consequences that we need to uh, resolve at greater expense in the future. Uh, I can say that we have reached almost the bottom of the curve uh, in terms of the environmental uh, quality in our region, and we need to, to think now how can we improve or change the curve to a better uh, condition uh, on a national level, but also on a regional level with international support. Therefore, cooperation with large institutions such as the World Bank, European unions and many others will help the, to create a, a support for the process and buy-in by the different uh, partners. This is again a, a replication of what we, needs to happen between the exchange of uh, energy and water. And I would like to mention that the uh, letter of intent that was signed in uh, last year between Jordan, Israel and United Arab Emirates did not include the Palestinians. Ecopeace wanted to include the Palestinians and we wanted to make sure that we supply Gaza with uh, water and with electricity. We would like to supply the Palestinian West Bank with water and electricity. So there should be projects uh, on both sides uh, of the Mediterranean in Gaza and in Israel of desalination so we can give each of the three countries, Jordan, Palestine, and Israel, uh, some kind of upper hand in one of the domains to supply water and energy for the other uh, countries. Uh, in doing so, we can create what we call healthy interdependency between the people and uh, the countries. Uh, again, uh, every project that we do is coupled with what we call the bottom up, and this is where we have tons of uh, uh, environmental education programs that include youth, women, uh, farmers, uh, municipality leaders, uh, name it. Uh, they all need to learn about their water reality. We need to learn about the adjacent neighboring country from the other countries' water reality, how we affect them and how they affect us, and how what can we do together in order to uh, find solution and alleviate the existing problems. Um, the, the work on the bottom up was uh, divided in so many categories, and I, I mentioned here a uh, few of them that include uh, building uh, understanding that saving the environment creates a win-win situation for all of us. And it's, it, it can come from the uh, faith base for those who believe in the three different religions. That's why we have the, what the Quran, what the uh, Old Testament and the New Testament speaks about the uh, different water uh, and how they look at rivers and streams uh, and that helps everyone to make sure that it's also coming from a faith. Um, we can work a lot on creating what we call new uh, economical opportunities that can help uh, creating sustainability in our region and create models in our region where they can see it, people need to witness. I can tell you for sure that most new generation in Jordan don't understand what a Jordan River used to look like because they never had the chance to see the river because it's a military zone, first of all, to the river today at existing condition. It's a small uh, little river, so they don't have the experience. That's why they needed to see models where they can see uh, the uh, where they can see uh, environmental restoration and rehabilitation and understand that there is a new reality that we need to look forward and work for it. The takeaways that uh, we would like to mention here that peace in our, in our region is not only uh, Middle East related, but it's also European. And we need to uh, expand the horizon of cooperation between uh, the Middle East and Europe at this stage. We, are, we have seen the weaponization of energy Therefore, the Middle East can also serve as an area of export of renewable energy, not only between the countries, but also across 
the regions to Europe as well. And we need to solve that because uh, we need to reduce the influx of um, uh, migrated, uh, mi migration from the Middle East to Europe. And that will happen if we have stable Middle East. So cooperation should come from both sides to provide their uh, uh, cooperation uh, components, if I may say. Uh, we, we know for sure that the climate change uh, is not only a threat multiplier, but also uh, it's a multiplier of opportunity. So uh, therefore, the transformation towards renewable energy and water energy would be something that we can uh, do uh, at, the, at the current stage. And we can uh, emphasize the, uh, the or, or help, make, help to make sure that the technology finds its own uh, way uh, at faster speed uh, to make sure that uh, we uh, have safe uh, renewable energy at the moment. And renewable energy is linked very much to water. It's very much linked to uh, food supply and stability. So uh, uh, we, we think that the uh, nexus here is important in order to make those uh, linkages between the uh, four component water, environment, energy, and agriculture. Uh, uh, the last, uh, the the last component probably I mentioned before, but again, cooperation with uh, European uh, in order to uh, solve the issue of uh, refugees has uh, to be uh, based on increasing awareness uh, at the uh, household level in our region, and how can we make sure that we are resilient uh, towards the climate change? How can we do to adapt? to the new uh, uh, environment that is changing rapidly. Um, that will help uh, both communities in the Middle East and in European countries not to uh, stress uh, one or the other ecosystem because of sudden uh, influx of uh, people. This is something that is uh, beyond a small support here or there. It needs to be a, a stronger a program. I remember that the European Union worked on the neighborhood policies and here, I think that it's very much needed that we expand on water, energy, sustainability component, not only from a human side, but also from, uh, again, security side, because we can see that instability in our region can lead to larger uh, security risks, uh, unpleasant uh, situation uh, in the future. Probably I should stop here. I don't know if I have more time, but I can stop here and... Uh, uh, open the floor for questions. Thanks a lot, Abdelrahman. Thanks a lot for uh, a very insightful presentation as well. We will indeed now open the floor to the audience for questions, comments, uh, for sharing experiences or insights from your own work, if you would like. Um, I have questions myself uh, for our two speakers, uh, but if you would like to submit a question or to make a comment, uh, please either raise your electronic hand or um, uh, feel free to let me know in the chat that you would like to take the floor. Uh, you may also simply write a question or a comment in the chat uh, and I will uh, read it for you if you would rather not take the floor using your microphone. Um, I can already see a question from uh, Dobrostava uh, Victor, uh, Mac, in the, in the chat. Um, would you like to use your microphone or would you prefer that I read it for you? Yes. Hey, uh, yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for both um, very interesting presentations. Um, yeah, my question is, uh, is related to the Iraqi context. So I'm, I'm very much interested, yes, I know that the civil society, the organizations, uh, various uh, groups and initiatives are addressing um, many issues, many problems, including the uh, ecological ones. Um, but also we know, we know that Iraq's economy is very much dependent on, uh, on oil and on oil export and a lot of finance comes from it. And, uh, and uh, um, in the context now of climate change, of the need to, uh, to go away from fossil fuels, um, is there any um, discussion, any debate among civil society in Iraq, how to address the issue, which uh, seems to be one of the core uh, challenges for, 
um, for sustainability, for a sustainable um, a transformation, um, the, the departing from, um, from the oil. Thank you very much. So let's, let's take, take, take a few questions before uh, going back to our two speakers. Uh, so I see um, a question from uh, Diego Osorio. We are developing a global grassroots community of practice to connect and empower those facing these issues at the front line. How can we collaborate? Uh, so I think that's a, a useful question about uh, you know, collaboration in general across civil society organizations, uh, across uh, governments and authorities and civil society, uh, and also with regard to the role that uh, international actors, the European Union and others may play in supporting civil society. Uh, so uh, that uh, may be a question for two speakers. Any add additional insights that you may have on how to support collaboration across civil society and with governments? Um, and then I see a question from uh, Marcelo Gerlach. Uh, I would like to ask about capacity building for civil society, especially young people. What are challenges? What are educational priorities? How to do it in a participative, uh, participatory uh, manner? Uh, so again, uh, I think a very important question about how to engage, how to uh, address the challenges and supporting also uh, civil society actors, young people, diverse young people, uh, to play their own roles in addressing those challenges uh, and any insights you may have will be will be helpful. Um, perhaps we can start with those three questions. Uh, again, if others would like to, to ask questions or make comments, feel free to raise your hand or to ask them in the chat. Um, we can perhaps start in, in reverse order. Uh, Abdel Rahman, would you like to respond to some of those questions? Uh, yes, I can do that. Uh... Definitely. Uh, there is, um, thank you, Diego, for your question. We can definitely uh, work on cooperation. There is a lot that we can do in order to empower our community uh, members. Uh, it's very important that people feel that they are connected and part of larger international solidarity uh, and movement that can help them uh, to gain experience, uh, to learn about new methods and approaches. And of course, there is a lot that we can do, and probably the the easiest at this stage is to organize a call and we can speak in specific what can be the lesson learns and what could be the cooperation that uh, we can do uh, uh, in order to foster this kind of uh, community engagement and uh, uh, learning experience. Concerning this, uh, the last question, which is capacity building uh, of civil society and what are the challenges? There are many challenges. Um, usually the level of education the priority of young people uh, on the ground are not really the same ones that we're trying to advocate for. So usually it's a challenge to bring people to speak about the environment, speak about water, and speak about biodiversity in this region and climate change. Therefore, you have we have to make the linkages very clear how uh, the climate change impacts uh, their lives directly, trying to create those direct uh, linkages. Uh, it's not an easy process, it needs lots of empowerment, therefore we have a big program in the Middle East that we call Water Diplomacy. And it attracts people at the age of 21 to 35, trying to teach them about all sorts of uh, tools uh, to help them to see how can they improve their lives and their economics as well uh, through uh, the learning process. So we have uh, one project about the uh, water diplomacy, the second one speaks about green social entrepreneur and here what are the new projects uh, in the in the field of environment water energy and agriculture uh, how can we help those people to find new solutions new ideas to help them to improve their lives the key here is to make sure that young people see the the effect on their lives directly and uh, start to be to engage at early stage if i may say I'll stop here. Thanks for that. Uh, Haider, would you like to respond to some of the other points for the same ones? Sure, sure. Yeah, excellent questions. On uh, the first one related to uh, uh, civil society participation in Iraq around the debate about uh, sustainability and climate change uh, effects, uh, the participation is still limited at its very, very early stage in Iraq. 
very recently, uh, the government took the initiative to establish uh, local bodies at the governorate level uh, to start to uh, analyze uh, the issues, try to generate alternatives with the hope that they can come up with a national level strategy to address the implications of climate change. Uh, in this platform, the contribution of civil society is very, very limited, unfortunately. We anticipate that it will grow over time, uh, but that's the thing. Here is the right moment uh, to advocate for better engagement of civil society uh, in this uh, process, because obviously they are um, in, engaged in different programmings in, in different areas, and they have a lot of granularity and factual based uh, researches and analysis that can uh, provide and help uh, supporting decision making and and, and policy making. Um, I hope this answer is, uh, is 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 useful on the capacity building. Uh, yes, like I said, that's a new trend uh, in Iraq. Uh, technical expertise are still very limited. What is practically needed uh, at local level civil society actors is to be exposed to uh, tools, methodologies, approaches on raising awareness, uh, uh, advocacy uh, campaigns, uh, promoting uh, uh, collaboration between uh, communities and uh, local authorities, uh, raising awareness and uh, how to cope with, uh, with the situation. Um, I mean, uh, the need is uh, is very high. The consequences are uh, very dire. We've been talking about uh, through our presentation that entire communities are migrating to urban cities, increasing urbanization, creating a lot of competition over uh, distribution of uh, public uh, services, local economies, uh, job opportunities, uh, uh, et cetera. So there is a lot that needs to be done. Uh, civil society actors are not fully aware uh, around how uh, how to do it uh, properly, actually. Yeah. So I'll start later to, uh, for that. Uh, great. Um, again, if you have questions, comments, I know that a lot of uh, the organizations represented in the audience do engage uh, in the region also in relation to the dual objectives of uh, promoting and supporting peace and uh, protecting the environment and adapting to, to climate change. If you have uh, you know, examples from your own work that you would like to share, please feel free to, to do so, or questions that you may have for our speakers. Um, I have a question to our, to our two speakers since we, we discussed uh, very much how men and women could be affected differently uh, by, by the effects of climate change and the conflict dynamics that may be exacerbated by, by climate change. I was wondering if you could expand a bit on, on some of those um, you know, specific challenges that you may have identified for, for diverse men, for diverse women, uh, you know, among young people uh, especially. And if you have any additional thoughts on, on how to address some of those, uh, those difficulties. And I would also like to, um, like to ask you, since you discussed some of the important, uh, you know, important aspects of, of fostering collaboration, including uh, you know, between the environmental protection community and the, and the peace building community, working also with, with uh, authorities that are sometimes uh, you know, siloed. I was wondering if you have any additional thoughts on how the European Union and, and other international actors uh, should support the connection again between climate and environmental expertise uh, and peace building expertise, how to make uh, you know, those two fields uh, work hand in hand. You've given good examples from, from the projects that you've been working on, but any additional thoughts will be, will be welcome. I don't see any other hand or comments in the chat for now, uh, so I'll uh, give the floor back to Haider first, perhaps. Absolutely. Yeah, on uh, the collaboration and what uh, the EU um, uh, can do, I think um, now is, uh, again, uh, the right moment because um, now the government is taking practical steps uh, towards creating uh, 
a, a strategy at a national uh, level. And like we said, they are creating uh, a workforce. By workforce, I mean they are creating local committees at a governorate level, comprised of members from the Ministry of Environment, uh, heads of administrative units, in addition to subject matter experts and key civil society uh, activists. This is an excellent makeup, uh, properly diversified. Uh, what we are uh, uh, concerned about is that this governmental effort is not going to be receiving a proper support from international uh, actors, especially international organizations with relevant technical expertise, so that uh, this strategy and its, its element is realistic and it speaks to the actual needs uh, at a, a national level, taking into consideration the political division and uh, security and uh, other issues in the country. It has to be extremely cautious of conflict sensitivity and uh, take into con consideration the do no harm uh, uh, aspect of it. And it has to come uh, with a proper capacity building and orientation campaign because strategy, action plan, that's fancy. It needs to be implemented and workforce needs to be aware and have the proper tools and know-how in order to be able to, to implement it. Uh, what uh, an organization like an EU can do is to organize the process. That's very uh, key role. Um, I don't know how it works. It could be a secretariat uh, for this uh, platform to make sure that is organized, solution-oriented. There is a proper follow-up mechanism proper uh, monitoring tools are are deployed and there are some accountability uh, measures are uh, put in place and more importantly is to make sure that the integration is is there when it comes to the implementation there is enough space for different actors working on this profile to have frequent conversation exchange that is constructive to avoid duplication or um or uh, overlaps and also to maximize the space for local civil society actors as well as community representatives to have a say in the process either in the design or implementation or on later on uh stages that's what what i mean by organizing uh uh the process not necessarily to sponsor it uh but to be a key uh, enabler for the government to organize the process, part of this task is to provide uh, enough technical support to relevant uh, government offices, such as Ministry of Environment, Council of uh, Ministers, and high-level uh, policymakers. Um, should I answer the, follow the the other question, or I stop here? If you have some thoughts, feel free, and then I will turn uh, to Abdel Rahman afterwards. Yeah, on integrating the role of, of uh, women and, and youth, that's that's key. And in, in my mind, they are not uh, two isolated uh, topics. When we talk about building peace, protecting environment, dealing with the implications of environmental degradation, uh, it's, one, it's, it's one package. We are addressing community grievances, bridging divides, creating common grounds, uh, between disputed uh, communities, regardless what the reason uh, is. Uh, now that we are talking about uh, uh, water scarcity, extreme drought, um, desertification, these are uh, technically related to implications of uh, 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 climate change. And this, in this sphere, the contribution uh, in a broader sense of women and youth is very, very limited. And that is very unfortunate because big issues are addressed by tribal leaders, key community actors, uh, mayors and, and sub-mayors. And that is something that started to be addressed the past uh, few years, uh, but the steps taken are small, uh, let's say. It has to be maximized. There is just a lot of uh, youth and women workforce, there is a lot of potential and motivation that they have. They just need the platform to make their voices heard. 
if civil society cannot provide them the safe space, then that's going to be a, a, a big problem. Uh, there are enough capacities and know-how when we talk about uh, local civil society actors because they have been engaged in different programmings in the past and now they know why it is important. It's not only to satisfy the donors to maintain participation of women and, and, and youth, but now they actually acknowledge the importance of their participation. They have witnessed positive examples out of their uh, uh, participations. Um, we as an organization working on, for example, brokering peace agreements between uh, disputed communities, we have seen it uh, uh, like practical examples that without the contribution of youth and women, the peace agreement has no value. It will not be sustainable. It will not be uh, respected in terms of terms and conditions in, 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 in the agreement because they are a significant uh, force in, in the community. They have a lot of motivation and positive energy to make change uh, happen. Community leaders, elderly, have started to see the value of their contribution, but it's not everywhere. I mean, only when there is a, a proper peace initiative, speaking from our knowledge, because we are a peace building actor, uh, only when there is a proper peace initiative that explains why it is important uh, to engage women and youth, they started to change their perception and change their, uh, their, their mindset. But in other areas, in other venues, where there is no programming in, in place, the classical mindset is still there, that women and youth have no voice, they know nothing, they are not important, we are the elderly, we can resolve the issues of, of the country, which is, um, as everyone in this room knows, is a myth. This is not true at uh, at all. Uh, we would encourage <clears throat> organizations working on this profile, addressing the implications of climate change on peace and security, uh, that engagement of women and youth sits uh, yani as a, a top uh, priority because we are going to deal with uh, a very localized uh, level in order for us to be able to address existing issues. Uh, by excluding women and, when, and, and, and youth, our success will be in question. Um, I'm sorry I've taken too long answering this question and back to you, Lorenzo. Thanks, Heather. Uh, Abdelhaman, I'll turn to you. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Haider. You, you elaborated a lot on the gender issue. I would like to add that the culture used to be in our region that not only uh, women and uh, youth are uh, excluded from the process, but also civil society and many actors were not included in the past in the uh, decision making process. Uh, I can say that uh, the engagement, it comes from necessity uh, because uh, different group, different target group are differently affected by the different conditions that we have in this region. And people do not believe at the beginning that they have the right to suggest solutions or to be part of the discussion. Uh, at the moment, we try to encourage more and more participatory approach that include everyone and exclude, exclude no one and to, to surprise that more people are becoming more committed from those neglected uh, sectors, uh, gender uh, uh, in our society. So yes, in full, we're in full agreement that uh, women and youth should be uh, participating uh, and all, at all level, not only to discuss and express themselves, but also to take decisions and to be part of the decision making process at all level, and not only in the consultation uh, only. Coming back to the first question, which is um, the European Union and what can be done. Um, there is a lot to be done. Uh, we understood today that uh, the, the, the globe uh, reacts together to different uh, crises in different forms. And therefore the Ukrainian uh, situation today is showing us that the, the war between Russia and Ukraine it has an impact on every commodity in our life. Uh, it has changed everything. Therefore, the uh, solution should be comprehensive at uh, a larger level that include the EU and other uh, larger entities. We believe that uh, securing uh, renewable energy sources could be one solution. So uh, the production of hydrogen, green hydrogen, 
from the Middle East towards uh, Europe and other uh, regions, and the development of renewable energy uh, sources should be uh, the lead and should be uh, uh, the research the uh, uh, to make it mainstream and also uh, implementation uh, should be also sponsored and uh, facilitated to large extent uh, in this kind of uh, energy transition. Uh, we need to make sure that the linkages between water, food, and energy should be uh, linked directly to national security, to the regional security. So when we speak about security, we're not speaking about the military security only, but we're speaking about also uh, providing the uh, basic needs for the human societies. If we don't have water, if we don't have energy, then uh, national security is uh, at risk. Therefore, we need to make sure that security uh, councils or security meetings are helpful. And I can mention, for, uh, as for example, that the German presidency invited ECOPIS twice uh, to uh, the United Nations Security Council to speak about water and energy in the Middle East. And that was helpful to spread the awareness about the need for more cooperation uh, coming to the Berlin uh, and other important uh, uh, events. Uh, I think it's important to make sure that the decision-making uh, process in Europe uh, understands the severity and the complexity of decisions and the implication on uh, water, uh, food security, uh, etc. So the dynamic should be very uh, uh, clear. The, the availability of uh, emergency funds and emergency intervention should be also uh, be there uh, in our region. Yes, it helped us at the beginning to absorb the shock of the Syrian refugees, but today it does not resolve the issue of the groundwater aquifer that is at risk. It does not look at the consequences of uh, pollution, etc. Therefore, we, we have to make sure that the continuity of solving the problem uh, is there and the European responsibility in this is uh, it's very clear and we, we're not asking the European uh, Union only to to help, uh, no, it's, it, it's the, the European Union is part of the system and there is a responsibility shared by all uh, in this regard. Therefore, I, I think it's the message is clear that no one region is isolated, but the whole uh, inter, uh, the whole region should be uh, interconnected. We believe that in the future, the Mesopotamian region, as my colleague Haider mentioned, the, the, the complex situation in Iraq, it's not in isolation of Iran, Syria, Turkey, et cetera, on, on water, should be expanded uh, in terms of uh, regional cooperation. We think that the Middle East, Mesopotamian, and European, North Africa should also in some kind of uh, connection and in, in harmony when we speak about uh, a major solution uh, for this region. Uh, I think time is limited uh, until another crisis comes and we have to be well prepared uh, if we look at the European aid today to Ukraine, if that European aid was invested before the war in renewable energy, in water, in sustainable development practices, that could solve many problems and maybe could uh, reduce the severity of the war at, at the moment. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Adel I am conscious of time, so we will go for a final round of, of questions or comments uh, before giving back the floor to our two speakers for final thoughts and, and responses. Um, do not hesitate to ask a question in the chat if you would uh, prefer doing so rather than taking the floor, but I see uh, Lorenzo Conti's hand uh, raised. Go ahead, Lorenzo. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the, the presentation. Very interesting discussion as well. So, uh, well, you, you touched a bit on this already, but I was just curious to hear, um, well, given the sensitivity and importance of access to water and general resources, food in the Middle East, and maybe also, um, yeah, discussions on energy transition, to what extent this could actually be an entry point for uh, discussion in broker and peace agreements or in general, uh, while holding peace talks and in, in general efforts of mediation and dialogue among different groups in the region. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Lorenzo. So indeed, uh, those uh, those issues as entry points for for peace and cooperation. 
Uh, perhaps I'll ask a, a final question before uh, giving back the, the floor to you, and this is directly related to, to uh, uh, a point that you that you just made, Albert Abdelrahman, about the availability of, of funds. Um, you know, sometimes when there are investment plans that are launched for climate adaptation pro projects, environmental pro protection projects, uh, we can see that sometimes they may also have uh, detrimental effects on, on, on peace and conflict dynamics. And this is something that, uh, either you also touched upon when you discussed the importance of conflict sensitivity, uh, et cetera. And so I was wondering, uh, since there is an increased uh, interest from international actors in investing in, uh, you know, tra green transitions, climate adaptation, environmental protection, would you have recommendations to ensure that those investment plans are uh, conflict sensitive? Um, I think that I briefly saw a hand raised. Uh, if anyone else would like to take the floor, please feel free to notify me. It may have been... Uh, Leo Siebert, uh, I'll give you a final chance to raise your hand. If not, I uh, will go back to the speakers. All right, uh, Haider, I'll give the floor back to you for responses and any possible last thoughts. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah, on the water uh, issues, um, here is the thing. We are talking about different uh, scales um, of the problem. Now that we are engaged at a local level uh, as a pilot phase, uh, we have seen existing uh, conflicts, tribal conflicts <clears throat> around, <clears throat> sorry, around uh, water shares that goes into agricultural lands. And this is where we can uh, convene to, uh, to create a settlement so that the distribution becomes uh, more balanced and resolve the, uh, uh, the issue. Uh, speaking, yeah, it sounds easy uh, when, when we uh, talk about it, but it's very complex, uh, very difficult uh, process, it requires engagement of a large scale of actors. Uh, however, this is uh, where we can <clears throat> have these arrangements documented and have it integrated with the uh, uh, local authorities uh, plans, priorities, and everything. There were examples where we identified that there are small solutions that require very small uh, resources from local authorities. They are budgeted. It's just a, a, an issue of prioritization by, by local authorities. So that said, if enough pressure, enough lobbying and, and advocacy and the right a conversation with the right people is established, then this will come at the top of the agenda. Solutions uh, could be created uh, for it, like, um, I don't know what the technical names uh, uh, for it, but there are solutions that grants uh, access to water resources to agricultural farms, for example, so that the people uh, can address their issues, uh, stay better than leave to urban cities, reconnect as local communities and uh, tribes and uh, everything. Um, on a larger uh, scale, that's a diplomatic conversation across borders. Uh, Iraq, we know that uh, political actors did some conversations. We know that there are political interests between Iraq and neighboring uh, countries, not necessarily uh, you know, best fit with the needs of uh, the, the Iraqis. That's why we always advocate for a third party convener uh, for these cross-border uh, conversations. Uh, it's beyond my capacity to say uh, if this should be a peace agreement or some sort of documented uh, arrangement between two countries uh, or more. Uh, but yeah, uh, a strategic uh, solution has to be taken. A third party has to convene uh, this conversation. It could be EU, it could be um, any other distinguished uh, organization. Uh, however, um, in, in conclusion, uh, to ensure a proper response, we cannot take pieces of the uh, of the issue. It has to be, as we said in our presentation, holistic at a national level, cross-borders conversation at the same time, finding alternatives, finding ways to address 
localized issues, uh, mitigate existing tensions, uh, prevent escalation to violence and further uh, community divisions, uh, etc. Yeah. So, Hader, for that, uh, Abdelhaman, I'll turn to you for your final responses and thoughts. Yes, uh, I, actually, I would like to benefit from uh, my colleague Haider uh, points, uh, saying that uh, we need to create what we call the local language between the different parties. That they speak the same language, the, uh, the win-win situation, but in a very local uh, sense, and uh, trying to use what we call nature-based solution, simple solution as much as possible, decentralized at the moment. This is something that is very much needed, trying to reduce the severity of large scale uh, projects. But some of the some of the solution needs large scale uh, level. And at the large scale level, I think that the level of engagement uh, should include uh, private sector uh, in very clear format. And uh, the, the monopoly that we used to have here in the, in the Middle East when, we, when it comes to oil, electricity, water, etc., who runs it, who distributes it, and uh, access to it, uh, that should end by providing equal opportunities for uh, as much private sector or society uh, members uh, in, uh, in the engagement process. The, the other thing that is, uh, is really important, which is the championship. And uh, my colleague Haider spoke about third party, and we believe that sometimes championship. Uh, championship from outside the region can be helpful, but we also need local champions. Uh, we encourage uh, international and local champions because this is where we can keep the, the ignite, uh, the, the light still uh, on and make sure that uh, local people are responding to their local needs within their local context, within their culture and values, and make sure that it's translated to the basic language that people use it in their daily life to make sure that the, uh, the uh, we have societal engagement at large, and that is the main drive for sustainability for the future. We don't have parachuting project on uh, some societies. They don't understand it. They don't uh, engage. They don't even comprehend uh, the complexity of the language that it's utilized. Therefore, I think that multiple engagement level is very much needed uh, on all levels to make sure that uh, Again, the private sector takes uh, the required role in fixing the environment here uh, together with the local uh, stakeholders. Thank you. Thanks, Abdelhaman. Uh, and thanks again to our, to our two speakers for your very insightful presentations and, and responses today. I'll share in the chat uh, the links to your uh, organization's websites in case participants are interested in knowing more about uh, the, the, the work that you do. Um, feel free also to, to reach out to our speakers uh, if you have questions. Um, I'll also, I would like also to, to thank all of you for, for joining us today, for uh, listening to our speakers and, and engaging with us. If you would like to know more about EPLO, uh, to follow our work uh, and to receive invitations to uh, future events that we will be organizing, please do feel free to visit our website uh, and to subscribe to our newsletter. I'll share in the chat as well. Uh, links to uh, uh, engage with us and to follow some of our work on those issues. And finally, if you would like to participate in other sessions of the Berlin Climate and Security Conference, uh, please do feel free uh, to register for other sessions. Uh, the digital segment of the conference is uh, continuing, uh, so I will share this uh, in the chat as well uh, right now. So you have the different links. Uh, to engage and to follow uh, the discussions. Thanks again to everyone. I wish you a lovely day and I look forward to being in touch. Bye everyone.